but they weren't supposed to be married because at that time the United States Naval Academy did not let any ensigns marry for two years. And he was on, uh, he was stationed on the Oklahoma. And he had a pass that night. So he was down spending the night with his wife in the apartment above us. And we heard him go out. I mean, we got that call at about the time he probably was alerted from his ship. Or, I don't know, the Oklahoma was hit and, and sunk. Yeah, it took five torpedoes broadside and capsized. Okay, well, probably somebody off the ship knew that he was on leave. He was on leave. I mean, he wasn't a runaway. Yeah. But he wasn't supposed to be married. What was his name? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I mean, I did at the time, and I mm -hmm. talked to her, but they were very secretive. She'd get mail under her maiden name and under her mm -hmm. husband's name. But Why? he just missed it. That he, yeah, That's how right. he missed it. Why did they set up the women's air defense, air raid defense? To uh, free men for combat duty. So you, was it a civil defense type? Not really. We were working directly under Signal Corps. And we were, I believe, classified as civil service employees. And... Uh, we were paid by the Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't volunteer. I mean, we, we volunteered for it. They sent out, they contacted young wives like me without any children, wives of, of lieutenants or, you know, of, of Army officers. And that's how Phil heard about it. But then they didn't get enough. The turnover in that group was tremendous. I think in all, at the end, from World War, from the beginning of the war until the end, that there were more than 500 women who served mm -hmm. in the group. And actually, we'd started out with a group of 80. I would be one of the original members. Um, what have I been saying on that line? Oh, they also recruited Honolulu girls, mm -hmm. uh, junior league girls. We we got to know a lot of the old family, yeah. type Hawaii people. What about the Japanese Americans on Hawaii? That during that week after the attack, um, of course, she said they were Americans, but there was was a mistrust. Yes, I'd say there was mistrust, um, but my, see, I had a Japanese laundry woman, and uh, a lot of people had Japanese maids, and you really couldn't distrust everybody, otherwise you wouldn't have any trust in anybody. What was their reaction? Their reaction, I think, was uh, just... Well, it was fear more than anything, and I'm sure they did think that people thought they were the enemy mm -hmm. because of their color. I was in school, and I was not in school, I was in a class with a woman who lives here, and I can find out her name, I do not have it now, who was there. She was, she's Japanese. Oh, well, I'd like to talk And to she her. was living in the Japanese area. Yeah. I mean, Japanese area. I mean, her neighbors were all Japanese. I'm not taking mine. Are you taping? Yeah. Let me tell you a funny story that happened. There is a man back in Bartlesville. His last name was Ng. He's Chinese. Mm -hmm. And he was in Kansas City on December 7th. Mm -hmm. And he thought, oh, no. You know, I'm Chinese, but I've got to get back to Bartlesville where people know me. Mm -hmm. So Lee got in his car and drove and had the whole thing planned out. If they stop and ask, I'm Chinese, I'm not Japanese. And he was just nervous as hell. And just north of Bartlesville in Kansas, he was stopped by the patrol. Mm -hmm. And the patrolman said, are you Chinese? He said, no, I'm a Jap. And he said, I no. I all mixed <laughs> up. And he said, you didn't ask the question right. Well, of course, they arrested him right there. Mm-hmm and threw him in jail, and he tried to explain, he said, no, he didn't ask the question right. And he, the sheriff 
uh, Barnesman had to go up and identify him because they were good friends. As Chinese. But he was so nervous. He was so nervous. No, I'm a Jap. He meant to say, I'm not a yeah. Jap. Or, Are you Japanese? No, I'm Chinese. Oh, that was terrible. Well, I can sure find out that girl's name. And we were in a writing course, and we were supposed to write on the most terrifying experience we'd ever had. I guess there were a group of about 16 of us, men and women. She wrote on that, on Pearl Harbor. I wrote on Pearl Harbor. Bob Winslow, who lives here and who taught with me at, at Mayfield, uh, wrote, talked about Pearl Harbor because he was stationed on Wake Island and he was a prisoner of the Japanese all during World War II. He lives here? He lives here. I can talk with him too. He's a native Oregonian. I believe, from Oregon, I think. But anyway, he's been living here for some time, and he's married to an Oklahoma woman, and yes, he teaches out at Putnam City School. But So we all three wrote on that, and that was amazing, but the teacher there said that she and I ought to get together and write an article from the uh, American side or from the, uh, the not I don't really mean American from the white side and from the Japanese side but we never did that's been over a year ago I can just put things I'm great at procrastinating mm -hmm. so we didn't do it but she uh, would have been a good article well, Jane Adele told me that we shouldn't go to all the trouble to write the article until we had a market for it so she kind of put a damper on it, too. She said, you could write off and tell them what you propose. I think there's a market for it now. You do? Yeah. Well, maybe this summer school's going to be out this week. I'll, how will I find out who that woman, what the woman's name is? I think I can find out. Um... How long were you in the woman's air raid defense? Okay. See, I was just in from January until the end of October because then I was going to have the first child. That was in 42? That was in 42. So both those children were born there. And uh, then I kind of think they'd forgotten about me or why bother with her, you know. And I'd lived there long enough, and I felt like a resident. I really did. So I'd think that they just, uh, they just didn't know what to do with me. So I was safe, and we had um, uh, four and a half years there. When did you first go to Pearl Harbor to see the ships? Okay, that's a good question. My first time back out to Pearl Harbor after the 7th mm -hmm. was probably when Phil's brother, H.V. Bird, came through the islands, and, we, and he, was, uh, he stopped over there. He was on his way to the Pacific, and it was right after the uh, battleship Missouri had been built. See, all during that time, the United States uh, was trying to get uh, Navy back together. So when uh, H.V. Byrd came through, he was gunnery officer on the Missouri. And it was in mm, early February, maybe late January of 1945. See, this I didn't get to go out there at all. There wasn't any reason. You had to have business to go out there. But... Uh, Phil's brother wanted us to come out and have dinner on board the battleship Missouri. So I got to go out there, and uh, uh, Phil, I think, sent an Army car up for me, and I went in through the gates at Pearl Harbor, and they stopped and wanted to know who I was and where I was going. 
No, I said I'm Mrs. Bird, Captain Bird's wife. A captain in the Navy and captain in the Army are quite far apart. Captain in the Navy is real high up. Captain in the Army is about third rank above nothing. So uh, they just said, okay, go right on. So I was supposed to meet Phil and his brother at the Officers Club on Ford Island. I remember that. And somehow we had trouble Yeah, at Ford Island. And in order to get to Ford Island, you have to get in a barge. So they drove me up to this little place, and I was supposed to go in the Admiral's barge. I think they knew that. But here I was, a very pregnant woman, getting into the Admiral's barge to go out to the battleship Missouri, and those sailors really didn't know how to take me. <laughs> they said, oh, I hope you're not going to have the baby on this boat. I, one of them said that. No, I'm not. Then we got on the battleship Missouri. We had dinner, and then I crawled, I crawled, climbed all over that thing. I went up in the gunnery deal, and uh, it was wonderful, uh, the experience of being on a battleship during wartime. And then later, I don't know if you know or not, but their surrender was signed on the Missouri there in Tokyo Bay, and uh, Phil's brother was in charge of the ceremony, in charge of the formalities and all. He was the one who told, uh, told Joe where to stand and MacArthur where to stand and all these people. And there's been something written up about that, too, in the paper. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, talking about long, long, long time ago. And I have pictures of that. I have a picture of of H.B. Uh, Bird with MacArthur and Nimitz. Was there still much wreckage at Pearl Harbor when you went there? It had it been pretty well cleaned up? It was pretty well cleaned up, but they had to, you see, because they had all these new ships in. And I've never visited that Arizona Memorial. I uh, have real mixed feelings about it. I, I, I just don't think I want to. They, it seems to me a big tourist attraction now, and that people really don't know what they're seeing when they get out there. I've been back to Hawaii three times in the last five years, I guess, 77, 78, 79. And I have good friends over there still, but I don't think they've been over to see the Arizona Memorial either. I've seen it from above. I've gotten a good look at it from the shopping center up above Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. But th at that time when I went out to Pearl, it was all pretty well. It was real organized. Yeah. Very much. Mm -hmm. Um. There was a, I tell you, somebody else in Oklahoma City who was there during World War II is Lloyd Benefield. Do you know that name? I know the name. Okay, he was in the Navy, and he was, he had quarters, I guess maybe at Pearl. And we went out there to see him. We went out there to a dinner party one night. This would be on toward the end of the war. At first, there was... It was no fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did have fun. We had our neighbors up to play bridge, and we had small parties. And when I was with the Women's Air Raid Defense, sure, we made our own fun. But it was no, there weren't any restaurants open and nothing to do on the streets of Honolulu. You still have blackouts at night. Blackouts from the moment Pearl Harbor was attacked until after the end of the war, they thought the Japanese might still do some damage. We, they didn't end blackout as soon as that war ended on September the 2nd. Maybe they did. When the Japanese surrender was, for, was signed, yes, I think they did. That was a night of real hoopy. Tell me about that night. Well, we, were, we lived up in a residential area, and we were... Uh, 
we went down to play bridge, have dinner and play bridge with our friends. But I remember across the street from them, uh, maybe Japanese family lived, and they were sure carrying on. And I'm sure they were all over the city of Honolulu, but I didn't see any of that. But it was, you know, I think we heard stories about how much drinking there was and the wild episodes and all. Um, then the after that, see, that was September 2nd, the night the surrender was signed. Then after that, they had a big parade in Honolulu to celebrate it. And I remember taking the children down. The children then were two and a half and six or seven months old. We wanted to be sure and have them there so that they'd remember it. <laughs> of course, they didn't, but we thought it was very important for them to go. And we went and parked someplace and watched all the, oh, I don't know if we had tanks rolling through the streets or not, but I remember the air, uh, the airplanes flying over, just waves of them. It's just thrilling as it could be. And we finally had won the war. Let me see. Now, I did get your first reaction. You realized the Japanese were bombing. My first reaction. Well, I think I told you. It was utter shock. A disbelief. Um, fear. Sure. But even that, it was all sort of numbing. Couldn't believe it was really happening. That those were really Japanese planes up there and that we were really going to be in a war and that I might not ever get out of it alive. I can remember thinking that. That I probably will die young. Too bad. You know, that just sort of flies through my mind. Too bad. I won't get to live to be old or have any children. But then as the war progressed, I thought, oh, well, I'm going to get to tell my children about this and my grandchildren. And that's why I've made a big thing about telling students the story during the years I've been teaching. And it has made quite an, I think, an impact, maybe not now, but during my earlier years of teaching, preceding the Vietnam War. I think a lot of them were really impressed and gave gave a lot of thought and had a lot of respect for me for what I'd done. I always told them that I volunteered for duty. I wanted to serve my country in some way, as did many, many other women. And we got the Rosie the Riveters and all of those people and the new waves and the wax and all those women's organizations. It wasn't just a man's war anymore. And the women's air raid defense was set up before the wax. Of the mm -hmm. We were the first, oh, this is what I told my students, we were the first women in uniform in, in the United States. I, I'd met a woman correspondent over there who had been a woman correspondent in the Spanish-American War. Her name was Peggy Duell, and she was quite a journalist. And there, of course, there had been nurses and maybe ambulance corps people. I don't know. There's a nurse that lives down by Wilberton. There was a nurse in France in World War I. Okay. I was supposed to go down and talk to her. But we were really the first women in a wartime duty not, connect, not connected with a medical, I guess. Now, you weren't actually military personnel, were you? Uh, that's a good question. We were working for the military. We were living on the military post. We ate, ate all of our meals at the officer's mess. Uh, we had orders, all kinds of rules and regulations, and we carried gas masks, war helmets. Uh, we had pistol practice. We did not carry guns, but uh, anybody who wanted to shoot that gun could take lessons. Pistol practice. Can you tell me what your average day was like being in the air raid defense? The From average. From the time you got up until you went to bed, what'd you do? See, I've kind of forgotten. 
Okay. I was living in this in this uh, set of quarters with two other women. Now, where was your husband at this time? He was stationed there, and he had separate quarters with a group of men on Fort Shafter. We were both living on the same army post. We got to have meals together, and occasionally we'd have leave that coincided, and we would go into town and spend the night at the Holly Kalani Hotel, an old, old hotel. We loved to go down there. And then we rented a, a small room, I remember that, but we didn't spend much time there. It was just so that we could have some time alone yeah. together, away from all the wartime stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but the average day, it would have been, you know, when we got out there and it was a month and a half after the war started, we had jobs, but we'd get up and uh, have breakfast and have fun. Those two girls, I just, I liked them so much. And if we had time, we'd go into Honolulu to shop. By then, things were getting, you know, pretty much back to normal. And then we would have to be back at the post before we would go on duty. Maybe we'd go have lunch someplace. What time do you go on duty? It would always be different, not always. We would we were on six we were on four shifts. So that if like the night of the Battle of Midway, I went on at seven PM, got off at one AM. Then a group came on one AM to seven AM. Seven AM to one PM. One PM to seven PM. That graveyard shift was the worst. The one AM to the seven AM. Just when you wanted to go to sleep you had to get up. But we went to sleep early. If we were, Let's say we were going to, to be on that graveyard shift. We would have come back and we would have had an early supper and we would have gone to bed probably at, at uh, seven, 7 or 8 o'clock to get a few hours of sleep. And we uh, would get up then and get dressed and get out of there with our helmets and our uniforms on. But we had a lot of fun, too, you know. Whenever we get together, we can remember all the funny things we did, like what? Somebody gave us a, a privilege of a beach house over on the other side of the island, and we had a station wagon assigned to the Women's Air Raid Defense, and we if a group of girls wanted to go get in that station wagon and go over to the other side of the island for the day, that was fine. We could do that. Um, we played bridge, a lot of bridge. And uh, we were all young married, and we were learning to cook. We had a kitchen in our quarters. We could cook if we wanted to and have our husbands, if they could get away, if they could come. Other all three girls married? Mm-hmm. All three girls were married. How come you didn't live together with your husbands? Because uh, that was a no-no. The husbands had to be on duty. Like Ruth Sykes' husband was stationed way up in Kalihi Valley. He had a, uh, he was in the field artillery, and they had a gun up there some way. And he had to stay there at that place all by himself with about three enlisted men. I think he was the only officer. I could be telling this wrong. But he was up there, and she'd go up there to see him and stay. They just took over a civilian house. He had a nice house, and we used to go up there, too, to see them and maybe have dinner. Beautiful surroundings up there. Hawaii is so pretty, and at that time it was even prettier because the a lush growth of vegetation and, and not veg flowers, folia, birds and everything. We didn't have they didn't have all that many people. They didn't have that many buildings. So that that took care of her husband and then June's husband was out at Schofield. And when he got orders to go on farther in the Pacific, then she came home. I believe she came home about the time I left to have my first child. 
but it was all kind of a temporary setup, so they wouldn't let anybody live together. I mean, if we'd rented a house, we might we couldn't sign a lease. We couldn't uh, say we were going to be there for two months because we might not be. I was reading through a letter that I wrote home and said, if I get to stay here and have the baby, you know, if, if. There was no assurance that we were going to be there. So that was why we didn't live with the husbands. Um, and then was, Ruth was lucky because Red had that house up there that if when she ever she could get off and go up there and she'd bake a pie or something and try to be homemaker type with it with him. But uh, and Phil was living with those three other men or maybe four in a big set of quarters at Fort Shafter. <clears throat> And we couldn't have men in our quarters after after 10 o'clock at night, something like that. That was regulations. No matter if they were the husbands, they could not be there. They had to be gone. I think occasionally, not very often, I'd spend the night with Phil, maybe down at that set of quarters where he lived. But I thought well, that I was intruding on their yeah. little deal because there were three other men there. But it was quite an experience, Joe. Anything else? I don't know if you've gotten the picture or not. Mm -hmm. the, like uh, I know all about it, but you don't. The photographs you have. Oh, okay. <clears throat> We had some pictures made, he and I both, I mean, in uniform, because I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, I want everybody to see that I really was in a uniform. Now, what are the wings for? Okay, that was because we, we all wore those. That said W-A-R-D on it, Women's Air Raid Defense. See, we were really protecting the islands from air attack. That was our main business by doing all the plotting of these flights of planes. Mm -hmm. And then that's my dress uniform, and here is my little cap, me with my cap on, and it has little wings too. Then when I got to be a supervisor, I got to wear bars on my shoulder. I think maybe I have bars on there. No, you can't see. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I did. This was an article that was in the paper, uh, December 7, 1956, 15 years after the attack. And there I am in uniform. You still have the uniform? No, wasn't that dumb? I threw it away when I moved to Tulsa. But I was in Scottsdale, Arizona this February, and uh, I ran across a girl out there who had been in the Women's Air Raid Defense, and she had her uniform. You have your wings? No. Isn't that awful? I don't know what happened to him. I surely didn't throw the wings away. They just have disappeared. I, and that girl had her wings, too. Then this is a picture of us at our quarters. And see, we have on our helmets. Mm -hmm. And a uh, girl from Oklahoma. Girl from Michigan, I believe. Girl from Oklahoma. And that's me from Oklahoma. Who has this picture? Uh, it's just a snapshot, and it's upstairs. I have the original. I had these run off on a Xerox machine. It's pretty good copy, mm -hmm. though, wasn't it? Yeah. Sent it to the girls. I think I have the negative. Yeah, I believe I had the negative. I had the negative made from that Would picture. Would you let us make some copies of these photographs mm -hmm. for the archives? Mm -hmm. Surely. Then... See, here's one of our newsletters, not newsletters, it's a newspaper, and the title of the paper is Drawn and Quartered, <laughs> which is kind of a play on words because mm -hmm. uh, we were quartered right there at Shafter. Notice the price of our little paper. Five cents. Five cents. And then here's another one. Uh, that's volume... 
I mean, that first, that was number two, and that's number seven. I don't know how many issues they did of that. Those are the only two I have. At that time, I just didn't see any point in keeping all that stuff. Awfully, it looks awfully old now. And, and I have some old papers, Joe. Uh, and then this is what a letter looked like that had been opened by the censor. Mm -hmm. Opened by U.S. Examiner, Army. These papers, yeah, that's, that's uh, one yeah. of my students brought me this. That's a Houston paper, December yeah. the 8th. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I didn't think to save a December the 7th paper, but I had this one from September the 2nd, and that's a Honolulu advertiser. And then I know what I have. When I went back over there in 77, they, they were selling these as souvenirs. See, there's your first extra. Yeah. That's the Honolulu Star Bulletin War declared December the 7th. There were there are three extras in there. It tells about how, what, one of them says, civilians ordered off the street. But they had no idea how many people were killed or how many ships were sunk, and nor did anybody ever know. Yeah. No one ever knew. And the people on the mainland didn't know either. Because of the strict censorship that went in. And as I said, we were expecting them, the Japs to come back any time, and especially if they had known that our ships were all sunk. Mm -hmm. No, the um, Admiral Yamamoto was in charge of that, and he was going after the aircraft carriers. Instead of, and he'd gotten the, the battleships, and yeah. he wanted the carriers. He didn't want the battleships, he wanted the aircraft carriers. He wanted the carriers, aircraft carriers. They, they were, were all out. And they weren't there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think it was in the movie Tor 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 when he realized the aircraft carriers weren't there, he knew that they were in trouble. That they were in trouble. Yeah. That there'd be retaliation. I think he mentioned something that the dragon has been loosed. I think, it's I think that was made. his comment too. Yeah. yeah, well we've got a lot of old stuff. Let's see that I don't know what to do with that. Here's the one. Um, is that the one you how long that went on. The governor, Poindexter, was relieved and replaced by a military, military officer. Provost was, Marshall. Who was the military governor? I don't know. I mean, that's surely in the record somewhere. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. The schools were all closed. The banks were closed. Was there a school during the war in Hawaii? On, on Oahu. The island where Honolulu and Pearl Harbor and all that. The schools were closed. I do not know how long. Not for the duration, I'm sure. But maybe that first year, I don't know. Maybe they maybe they started them up again at the end of January. As I said, things were pretty much back to normal. <clears throat> but I remember going down to Honolulu to uh, the Liberty House store on the day of the Battle of Midway, June 4th, and there was hardly anybody downtown. And I had gone down to receive some instructions from a rug I was in with Case Jones. I started doing some hand work. We were all trying to think of things to do to pass the time. And I went up there and uh, there wasn't anybody up in that department, and the woman said to me, aren't you afraid to be out? And I said, well, no. And she said, well, the Japanese are heading toward Midway. So you see, we did have that much information. And I said, well, I'm going to go back home pretty soon. I think that, that Bible verse that I read to you, that was the only way that I could survive, that I had to be. I could not be afraid. And Midway is where we're, uh, Midway is in the northern Hawaiian Triangle. 
No, it's a separate plane, Joe. The Hawaiian Islands are composed of five or seven, seven or five mainland. Then <clears throat> Midway is halfway between Hawaii and Japan. It's just right out there in the middle. And uh, the Japanese intended to take Midway so that they would have a launching place to get Hawaii or the mainland. I've read different things that they were really not interested in taking Hawaii. They were interested in getting the mainland. I would think still they would have wanted to knock out Hawaii, but they would probably would have lost their rocket by now. But anyway, the the Battle of Midway was the turning point of the war in the Pacific because we sank their ship this time. And those B-17s that flew out there from Hawaii and back with just enough gas tanks to do that turned the war around. It's a great morale boost for everybody involved. Did you have news of the Battle of No. No, we just could see that those planes were going out and coming back. Then I think we had news the next day. But that night that I was on, no, we just knew that they were going out and coming back. But then I believe they did say, yeah, how many of the Japanese ships we had sunk. All that. Did you know? You knew something was going on. Yes. But did you know the Battle of Midway was going on all along? Yes. At the time I was on that plotting board, we sure did. We knew the Japanese were trying to take Midway. And there's another man here in Oklahoma City who was in that battle of Midway. He was on a PT boat, and his name was Dean Everett. His <coughs> he was a lieutenant, I guess, in the Navy. But he was on a PT boat and, and fought, had a front-line crew of that battle. Tell you, I get in touch with him. They're prominent family in Oklahoma City, and we spent a lot of time with them. We had a little Oklahoma group over there. What's his, what's his initial name? It's his son, his Harvey Everest's son, Dean I. Everett. Have you met him? You have? Yeah. yeah, he's quite civic minded, does a lot of things. Then another Oklahoman who was a prisoner is uh, Judge William O'Berry. You know him? He was captured by the Japanese <coughs> in the Philippines. <coughs> he was a survivor of an awful night. He was in Mark Nevada House. Mark Nevada House. Mm-hmm. <coughs> yeah, Bill was, I believe, in there. He was, or maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was just captured on shore with us. But uh, he had come through Honolulu <coughs> in early October, and we had said goodbye to him, and we took him down to the boat to go on to the Philippines. And I remember what an eerie feeling that was. That boat left about, I suppose, seven at night, and wives were down there kissing their husbands goodbye, and I thought, oh, that's a terrible night of crying. And I felt real bad about Bill Berry going with them on that gloomy mission that looked like it. And I don't think he was too thrilled about it either. It was just so much farther away from home than we were. And at that time, war clouds were forming. As you saw with 40. So. All things they should have been done at that time. At Mayfield Junior High, now School's almost done. And he worked with Robert E. Reed, I believe, who lived out there in Mayfield. Which is at Mayfield? At Mayfield Junior High. That's where I taught the last two years. Matter of fact, there was a little thing in the paper this fall in that Sunday section, that magazine section, about three POWs, and they interviewed Bob Kitcher was there, but they didn't interview him. I think they 
lot about all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. you're so funny. I'm going to say the Bush missed me in the political Again, I'm still at a great disappointment on all of it. Would you like to know about the air raid sirens going off? I I think that we had, I don't know how many, but we were always concerned about Japanese planes coming back because they'd done it once, right? So anytime an air raid, uh, I guess whenever they got something that really looked serious on that plotting board, they'd sound an air raid warning, an air raid alert, an air raid siren. And when I was living up in Upper Manoa Valley, this was after I after I stopped working at the ward, my little daughter was very small, and that air raid siren would wake her up every time, and she would just shake. And they went off, you know, like maybe once every month there for a while. Not testing. Maybe, and then I guess we did have some tests, too. Sure, we had to. But at, when I was out at the post, and we had their separate section for the women's air raid defense. There were air raid shelters across the street from us. And any time there was an air raid alarm sounding, we were supposed to get up and get our things together and go to the air raid shelter. And all it was was just a dugout thing. I mean, it didn't have any carpeting or walls or anything. Just some benches there. And I remember saying, I don't want to go. I would rather take my chances out here rather than be stung by a scorpion in one of those air raids. Because there were lots of scorpions and rats and such things in the air. But yes, the air raid, uh, we did have air raid alerts, air raid warnings. And one time, I think, or more than one, the Japanese sent plane or two over. Launch the first time I think I, and I've read about this and I can't tell you how I've heard it, that they were launched from up north of the island and they flew in and flew out, just maybe three of them. I think it was in March, maybe this is in the paper that I read it. But then another time, much later, after a Things were kind of settled down. I remember uh, air, ra air raid alarm sounding in the middle of the night and went out and I could see that plane up there. I think it dropped a bomb on an open, they found it, you know. Um, it didn't hit anything. Two things, I think. Two square, <laughs> a plot, an empty, uh, yeah, anyway, it didn't do any harm. But that was just sort of nuisance. When you were at the plotting board, were you plotting American and Japanese mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's why they identified. Had you talked to Japanese at the time? Oh, we didn't. No, we all we did was plot in the in our area. But I think that they did pick up the now I'm talking off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I think that time that three of them came in, that they picked them up. The radar did, yeah. and we got them on the on the plotting board, and knew that they were Japanese, and knew where they had come from. Forgotten the place. It was some place up there where they were sitting, and then when the, and the Japanese found out that we knew, so they never could do that anymore. Yeah. And how was the um, like? Can you explain the chain of The women's air raid defense. I say, do you have women officers? Do you have men officers? No, we had women officers. Women officers. Um, now, the lowest rank was, well, it wouldn't be a private, I guess, but. No, we really didn't go so much on rank. Let me look and see what that lady was called. She was uh, a Honolulu woman. There were two Honolulu women who headed this up, and they were older women. Like, they were probably 40. And then the rest of us were young, 20, 30. But Mrs. Erdman 
and I think it's Jen's last name, were supervisor and assistant supervisor. And uh, they went home to their husbands every night and left us all out there. <laughs> plotting. They didn't have anything to do with the plotting stuff. They were just the supervisors of the school. So, okay. I don't think that we really call it. I don't think. Yeah, Mrs. Harold Erdman was senior supervisor. And Mrs. Gwendolyn Williams was probably I think I think she was higher up than Mrs. Erdman. She was a top six. She was a commander. You mean in charge of all of our that would be a that would be a sigma for us. We had a man who was who was in charge of us. And that's what you're trying to get. Okay, if his yeah, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Larry Kendall, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Erdman, Miss Carpenter, Captain Tonka, and Rachel Rooney. They were the supervisors. Here we have a lieutenant colonel and senior colonel and a captain, and these women working with them. And then they would talk to us. The men officers would talk to us. A lot of times about our sloppy dress, and we weren't supposed to go out of the house without having a hat on or something, you know, and brown shoes always, no tight shoes or soft shoes. Or that was just a funny thing, but for goodness sake, they said, do not discuss your job with anyone. The walls have ears. Don't have too much to drink or talk. That's right. We had all that. And uh, then there was a really fine man, General Davis, who was, I think, Air Force. And he was really, I don't know what he had to do with us, but he sort of was way up there. And But he had a tea dance. He just kind of treated us like his family. He was fine. He called him Uncle Dave. Can you tell me what was Uncle Dave? We didn't have much. We didn't have much. No, we either had stuff from the mainland or if we didn't. Like there was plenty of fresh vegetables and fresh fruit, right? Then the Army Commissary got canned goods. They got uh, coffee, and I think the sugar was uh, grown on Hawaii, but it was sent back to mainland to be kept in the Navy. Oh, you mean the books were still there? Vegetables, yes. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any rationing that I can remember except gasoline rationing. That was just terrible. And did the gasoline come from Hawaii? Or? No. Came over. That island was not sufficient. We had self sufficiency. And there is any record that the gasoline was any good? I don't believe they ever did. The submarines were fighting. And I'm sure it also controlled the waters for the submarines and all that kind of thing. That could have been as well as the mine fleet. I don't believe they ever did much damage to us uh, as we know it at the time. But I know that Mother was going to make some coffee rations from the missing coffee. What we read about the coffee rations. And we were going to start making Kona coffee, which was going to measure the We didn't have too much 
me. This is what Phil says. Well, about a million things have happened. This was written December 22nd since our last show, as you can well imagine. As you may know, know we were asleep when the attack came, and believe you me, you've never seen a fast recovery than the one we made. I rushed Wilma over to a friend's house and then sped along about 65 MPH to report to the regiment. In the distance, as I drove the 10 miles from our house to Fort Shafter, I could see the Jap planes. Some were zooming, some were bombing, and some were just flying along. Arrived at the regiment, reported to the colonel. The regiment was still moving into field positions, and may it be said to their everlasting credit that they really moved. I set up the intelligence office, got the information rolling in from the field to higher headquarters, and then took a breath to see what was going on. The colonel came in at that point and told me to come with him. Off he started when one of the guards on the staff of the parade ground shouted, Look out, there they are. Well, if you've ever seen a dignified colonel and a rather less dignified lieutenant fall out of a car and get under a tree any faster than you did, I would like to know them. They machine gunned our area considerably, but fortunately didn't do a lot of damage at Shafter. The damage to Hickam Field and to Pearl Harbor is already well known. I went out there the next morning. We still got to go out there. And believe you me, it was plenty bad. Well, that probably got one of the Japanese planes, too, and I'm not sure where it was, but it came right off of the plane. And I think the Jap was still inside there. I don't think one of the guys had it. Since the three attacks, the three, we have had plenty of excitement of one sort or another, but never another real attack. Wilma has withstood the excitement remarkably well, and I've never seen her more calm than we were than when we were actually attacked that Sunday morning. Okay, the day after the battle, I called the adjutant general's office, and they were happy to advise me that no Oklahomans had been killed in action. Do you think that's true? I wired the Oklahoman to this effect, as I knew they would be glad to get the news. A few hours later, they called me and advised me that Bob Markley had been shot down as he was flying into Hickam Field from the coast. Uh, we had B-17s coming in that same day, and they were all shot down by our plane. Mm -hmm. Bob was one swell soldier. I tried to wire home and tell him how wrong I'd been, but the censor wouldn't let me. Well, you'd imagine getting to wire the first time if they knew they were going to And Bill Wiley is another one who was with us. He's here in town. Bill William Wiley. H. Wiley, W-Y-L-I-E. It's Colonel Jenner yesterday called to say that we've received $634 from Oklahomans. And I can tell you it made Bill Wiley and me feel pretty proud to be from Oklahoma. The men here in this and other regiments who are from Oklahoma are going to have a merrier Christmas as a result. And none of us have had much sleep in the last two weeks, and we think that I will mark a bed. Mm -hmm. That's what this says. How's my contact list to get to? Just list in the book. Yeah, I mean, William Wiley. Uh, William H. or W. H. Page 15. Isn't that interesting? So that's about what women did. Really interesting. There's another one that I thought was kind of 
done do it. Oh, this one is done. Toward the end of the war. Your victory. Mm -hmm. General Richardson's picture. Your victory came because you fought and worked for us. Unceasingly against terrible odds. You think Roosevelt knew about Pearl Harbor? I don't think so, Joe. I mean, whenever anybody asks me that, I just go, I really don't know. I don't see how, why, what was I reading the other day? Why would he have thought that that would be good to get rid of our battleship? You know, he would have been crazy. In Pearl Harbor, where our fleet was in the Pacific. Now, I think that the communications were slow. Now, you've read this, that by the time they knew the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor, and they broke that code, that there was no way to get the word to Short and Kimmel that fast. I don't understand that. I think they received a telegram that morning after the Japanese had already attacked. Wasn't this in Tora Tora? the Japanese were planning to attack Pearl Harbor. Terrible thing. That's bird. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, the uh, Yorktown and dragging it out. Yeah. What's your opinion on the atomic bomb and being dropped on this planet? Oh, well, it was a wonderful thing. <laughs> it got that war in a hurry. Saved lives. Well, I've and the Germans were so close to that. I was reading that too that they were just six months behind us. I mean. If we hadn't dropped it, they would have. Don't you think they would have? I've heard so. Looking for us. Mm -hmm. All after the children were born. And she was, uh, I guess, from this era, she was second generation American. Or maybe she was first generation. Her parents came over, they were not citizens. I think she was first generation. And she was first generation. And she was a student at the University of Hawaii and lived at our house. So that, um, well, that helped me with all that washing and ironing and everything else mm -hmm. I was doing. And in exchange for that, she got her room and board. And then she took the bus down to the university. So we had her, and she, her part of her duties were to cook the evening meal and to clean up and then to babysit when we needed her. One night, a boy from Oklahoma City that I'd known all my life called, and he had uh, been on the Doolittle expedition. Mm -hmm. And he was down there at the Royal Hotel, the, at the Moana. And we went down and picked him up. I did, I guess, not Phil. And brought him up to the house for dinner. And when he saw my maid, that Suko, he was furious. What are you doing with her in this house? He'd had plenty to do. She's the enemy. And I just kept saying, shh, shh. He was sitting way out on sort of a porch thing, and she was back in the kitchen, but she was serving the dinner. Oh, I was so embarrassed. He was pretty obnoxious about the whole thing. And I guess they'd, be, they'd just been playing with her. No. Is he, is he still living here in Oklahoma City? No. What happened? Well, I know what happened. Then he died, but he died young of a brain hemorrhage in the middle of the night. I think or a heart attack. I believe he was living in Wichita, Kansas. His name was Bill Priest. That just came to me. But there were a lot of people who 
we just didn't, who were so surprised and who still are so surprised to see all the Orientals living in Hawaii. And since the war, the Japanese have bought so much property there. Mm -hmm. They own just about the whole island. <laughs> they didn't have to take it. They bought it. Yes. Mm. Well, anything else? I don't think so. I okay. don't think so. Did we talk about the um, barbed wire fences around no. the island? No. As I, I started making some notes on Sunday, and then I went back. Uh, after the 7th, we were afraid that the troops, that the Japanese would land on the island. Mm -hmm. The military was afraid. So they put barbed wire fence all around the island of Oahu. And when I say barbed wire fence, I mean it was rolls of barbed wire fence. Concertina wire. Yeah, right. You know what I'm talking about. Mm. And then they'd have openings every once in a while, maybe, every three miles or something. And there'd be a soldier stationed there. But that was to prevent the landings. Then also, the fishing boats were stopped because they were run mostly by Japanese. And they thought that uh, there might be spy activity relating information to the submarines offshore or whatever, you know. But no more fishing boats were allowed to go out there. So that kind of stopped the food supply there. And I cannot remember how long that was in effect. But right after the war, they just stopped it. And I've already mentioned blackout and curfew. And everybody who did get to drive their cars, like Phil got to drive our car because he drove it off and out to the post, they painted the headlights black, except for an inner circle, which was blue, just to give a small blue light as you were driving. I think that's right. I was reading one of the papers that said that everybody was ordered to paint their headlights blue. I think it was just a small circle mm -hmm. on that headlight because those headlights at that time were pretty good size. And we were all to carry uh, flashlights. I think I mentioned that. And for home entertainment, we read lots of books. Lots of reading. So that about finishes what I had thought up. Oh, did I tell this little story that our work was so top secret and we had lectures on the importance of the secrecy. But one time I was walking out of the officers club and General Emmons, I think he was a lieutenant general and I think he was a high up in the Air Force, stopped me and said, pardon me, young lady, but what are you doing? What is your job? I had on my uniform. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. General Emmons, I can't tell you, it's a military secret. He just nodded and he said, yes, and walked on. So I don't know if he even knew what we were doing. Hmm. I bet he found out. Yeah. But we were not allowed to say women's air raid defense. We were not allowed to say anything like that. Keep your mouth closed. So I guess that's... Yeah, again, I think of something else. Well, thank you.